All right. Hey there, folks. Even though convention signings and other live events are back on track, I figured I'd keep bringing book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster, intriguing interviews with creative minds. So one of our continuing things on the show is to report back from the front lines. So please welcome tonight's guest, David Swenson, now an author of crime novels. David was a former police detective in Washington, D.C. Welcome, David. Good to be here. Thank you. All right, good to see you. Uh, just a quick heads up for the folks at home. Feel free to send notes or questions you have for David in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Okay, as we always do, we're going to start at the beginning. So where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Where was I born? Yes. I mean, I was born and there for maybe three months in Aberdeen, South Dakota, of all places. And um, well, my dad was in, um, I don't know what he was. He was at that time, it was like um, the newspaper stuff. But um, and then what? Where was I raised? Yeah, um, all over the world. Um, oh, okay, DC, okay, okay. Washington DC became home base, but okay. All right, well, dad, I, I yeah. want to get into that, so we're going to dive in a little bit. So mm -hmm. before we do, so what? What's your heritage? Like what? Like what? Where do you? Where does your family hail from? Well, that's strange. That's cool, man. Nobody's ever asked me that before. On my dad's side, it's uh, Welsh and, you know, English, a little bit of Norwegian. On my mother's side, it's 100% Ashkenazi Jew, a Russian Ashkenazi Jew. Okay, so, 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 you're, so, you're, so you're half Slovak. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I'm, well, yeah, I'm 51% Ashkenazi Jew, which is, a, is actually a curse. Not, obviously, not, not because of the uh, 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 Judaism, but because um they're cursed with um cancers and <laughs> and uh you know a lot of physical problems i don't have cancer but you know my family on my mother's side they've all suffered from and passed away from cancer you know the Ashkenazi jews i don't know what it is maybe i, I have no idea but i don't know i got, I got some i i have i have some russian jew blood. <laughs> Jew in me as well. So yeah. Well, it's the Ashkenazi, not the Russian Jew. It's the okay. specifically the Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, true. Fair yeah. enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's actually there's even like um, you know, in New York City when I used to live there, you know, there was there were a couple of doctors on up, you know, when you fill out the form when you're first seeing them, they go, they there's like actually a, a thing in there, they go, are right, you know, are is there any Ashkenazi Jew in yeah. here? Right. Yeah, because it's, huh. it's yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so was it just you? Do you have brothers, sisters? I have two sisters, an older one and a younger one. Okay. So you're the middle. What's what's the gap between you guys? Um, younger sister maybe six years younger than me. Older sister, you know, uh, a year and a half or something. Okay. So, so closer in age to the older sister. So, did you guys, mm -hmm. you know, get along? Was it normal, you know, sibling stuff or? Um. We got along. I mean, I was a sort of a tortured boy between the two, but then I became the torturer later. And, um, you know, meaning I picked on my sisters a lot. Mm -hmm. But then um, now I'm closer to my older sister than my younger sister. We don't really talk that much. So with the, I'm assuming just as, because I, I mean, I have, I have two sisters there. They're younger than me. And we mm -hmm. were really never in the same school because I'm four years older than them and you're mm -hmm. six. So I'm assuming as, as you were kids, you know, you were always maybe a school, school and a half ahead of your younger sister. So you were kind of probably had yeah. like disparate social but, circles. And Yeah. But then we went to American community schools, you know, overseas. So we were always like on the same campus. <laughs> you know, all all right. of so, so talk to me about that. So, you lived overseas a bunch. So like what what was the what was the sequence and, and why were you overseas? My dad was um foreign service. Um and I, I learned later it was a little more than foreign service, you know, State Department. But you know, we I grew up in Mexico City, Beirut, Lebanon, um Stockholm, Sweden, places like that. Wait, and, you said you were in Beirut? Yeah. Wait, so hold so hold on. So but what was so what was the sequence? You first went to Mexico City. So was Mexico that, City. Yeah. So it was Mexico City, then Beirut. Was that next? Yeah. Because my dad um was rarely there in Mexico City, but because he was in Yucatan, which um was close to Cuba. At that time it was the whole brinkmanship thing. And 
you know, the gorillas and all that. And, um, so he was like working with them. And then Beirut obviously was before the fall of Beirut. And, you know, it was like 1970. And uh, it's before about two years, three years before the civil war erupted again. You know, so there's always been a civil war in Beirut right. or in, in, in Lebanon. So it was a few years before. So wait, so then, Mexico um, City, Beirut, and then where? And then um, Stockholm. Um, and then, uh, believe it or not, my parents were uh, my parents were divorced at that time. So my dad was in Saigon, and my mom was in Stockholm. And Stockholm didn't have an American community school for uh, for middle schoolers. So I, I had the choice between Frankfurt and, uh, of all places, Mallorca, Spain. So what do you think? 16 year old boy, he's going <laughs> to pick, pick the girls and, you know, oh, yeah. teach, you know, so I was in Mallorca for a while at a dorm. Oh, huh. so, wait, so, so, so <laughs> hold on a second. So this is an uncommon experience as a, as a kid. No, I mean, there's a lot of us. Uh, no, oh, no. Well, I guess what I mean is if you talk to a hundred people randomly, 99 of them are going to, are not going to say I grew up in Mexico city, Beirut, Stockholm, and Mallorca. Yeah. Right. Except the ones I know. Right. Right. Well, yeah. but again, you were in kind of in a, in a, you know, in a particular carve out, right. Of, of the population. Yeah, yeah. Most people aren't like that. It, it may have been common in your particular circle, but in the mm -hmm. broad circle, pretty uncommon. So what, so what's that like to sort of, I got a lot of questions about this actually. So for you, so did you, at the time, did you understand like what your dad was doing and why you were in the places that you were in? In places like Mexico City, no, I was like really young. And uh, then it was just a, a little adventure for a kid. Well, actually Beirut was a huge adventure. But I didn't start like really wondering what my and City on the Edge, a book I wrote um, a couple of years ago, really was sort of semi autobiographical because that it, and Beirut is when I started really questioning, like, is my dad, you know, I, I had rom uh, romantic notions about what my dad did. And I always wanted him to be something, you know, like. Did you think he was like a spy? Or something? Yeah, a spy and stuff like that. And, so I, I really never questioned or understood it. And it became, you know, a part of our lives, you know, like every three, four years saying goodbye to your friends and, you know, moving somewhere. And, you know, when you get, um, it, it was tough, but then when you get on the plane and then start distancing yourselves from that location, it somehow does something to you and you, you, you're okay. And you start thinking okay well what's the next place going to bring right so um, let me ask does that make it because you moved around a bunch of times and it's not like you went from new jersey to you know to st louis yeah. or something i mean you we're talking completely different and especially then right different cultures different currency mm -hmm. completely different you know even though geographically the the space may have been no bigger than a state in the united in if you are here did that, did the shifting, did it make it easier in a way to meet new people because you got used to how to do it or does it make it harder or is it almost both at the same time? It was, uh, you know, it was, when you're in a um, an American community school setting, when, you know, the government puts you someplace, right. as, you know, in, in a foreign country and, and then you're, in a building where there's a lot of uh, other people in the embassy and kids and stuff like that, it's 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 easier because you you accept each other, right? So right, it's not right. like you know they're miles away. You know, I mean, everyone's you know pretty much together. You know, and so it it wasn't difficult meeting you know friends and stuff right. like that. You, um, I'm still friends with a lot of them. You know, now right. you know, I mean, it becomes a lifelong thing. Right. I would imagine kind of a, unique, yeah. and a unique it wasn't just a, a one country to another. I mean, in the United States, too, we moved from one state to another, you know, my whole life. I, 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 I'm jealous of those those people that grew up in a house, you know, right, a, a yard, and you know, had one high school. You know, I can't even 
I don't even know how many high school or schools I had as in my youth. I had tons of schools. So, so, I, so I have a few follow up questions there. So, one, so what is that? How does that affect you when you know that I end up in this in this new place? I know it's the top. I don't know exactly when the clock will run out, but it's the second I get there, I already know it's ticking. You what? don't really think I never I can't. I mean, maybe I did. I mean, right. now I can't like I, looking back. I I don't know if I really thought that way. I just thought that this is um, this is our home. And um, when it came to that point, like weeks before where we learned that we, we had to move, right. um, then it became sort of difficult sometimes, you know, sure. especially in Beirut when I was a teenager and um, a very, I mean, literally like 12, 13. And I had a girlfriend, you know, stuff like that. It was tough, man. Wait, I mean, so, so wait, yeah, you know, yeah, crap. You know, I don't want to do this. You know? Well, you, you had mentioned, you answered just a few minutes ago that you said Lebanon. You specifically, you said Beirut was a real adventure. Talk to me about that. I want to know what, 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 what made it such an adventure? I mean, places like very different cultures, Mexico City and Beirut. But, you know, now going, starting with Mexico City, you know, you know, back then there were no cartels, you know. I ran free, you know, in Mexico, in sandals and, you know, the villages and, you know, all that. And with no worry of being kidnapped or, you know, right. whatever. In Beirut, it was the same thing in the beginning. It, you know, I was shirtless, shoeless. <laughs> you know, I would, I would, we lived um, in a place uh in a place called the Gowi building, which is a was above the thoroughfare that stretched along the Mediterranean called the Corniche. And then you would have to cross the Corniche to the Mediterranean. You had the Mediterranean Sea right there for you as a kid. And um, there was the Hotel Riviera with all the... And back then, you know, there were a lot of... Um, it's not like you think like Beirut back then and now you have the real religious people but then you have the the men and women that were very um i guess westernized and like the women wore bikinis and you know stuff like that so as a kid it was very it was time you're a teenager you know like uh <laughs> in a place like that and it had you it really didn't have beaches where we were they were all reefs and so I, I grew up along the reefs and, you know, just diving off the reefs and, you know, snorkeling and never thought, and my parents never worried about me being um, hurt or again, kidnapped or anything like that. But then um, all of a sudden, you know, um, the trouble began and then there were curfews and, and we had to... Um, you know, stay in our rooms and not, we couldn't sleep on our beds. We had to sleep pretty much like on the other side of the bed away from windows because of snipers and explosions. And so, what, so hold on. So that's the what, which is a fascinating, but what was it like for you in that environment? As a kid, as sad as it is, it was an adventure as a kid. Looking back at it, it was, it, it's terrible, you know, thinking right. about, you know, the lives that were, were lost and you know, the destruction and the city that was just really freaking like destroyed, you know, but it's been destroyed several times. But as a kid, it's it's like we would sneak out. My dad was really never there because he was, I don't know what he was doing, but he was, wasn't was there. And my mother, you know, I mean, I, I could sneak out. We had a nanny and stuff like that, but we were able to sneak out of the apartment and get caught up in all these little adventures. And, you know, that but there were snipers, there were explosions. So it was, looking back at it, it was really stupid. Right. And if my dad had known what I was oh, doing, he, I would have been grounded. You yeah, know? And, for sure. Um, but it was just, uh, at that time as a little kid, you're, you're in a war zone and you see the mirages going up and, you know, you didn't know when they were bombing Palestinian camps, you didn't know that there was you didn't think that there was death. You didn't think those things when you were little. You know, you, you just thought that it was like a movie. There was that's war, you know, whatever. But you didn't. 
think of it the way I do now. And looking back at it now is pretty sad. But I'm as odd as it sounds, I'm thankful I went through that, you know. So you go I, I didn't go through anything terrible. I mean, it was the right. people who were living there that went through something terrible, not me. So you go from, you know, the very young in Mexico City, then you go over, end up in Beirut for how long you were there, maybe? About so, four years. Four years, and which, you know, in this completely di different kind of environment, and then the violence came, and then you go to Stockholm. We did. Were you in Stockholm for a while, or was it just kind of a transitory thing? We were in Stockholm for. Um, I was in, during the school year. I was in Mallorca. So, so what is that? So, so what is that transition like to go from you know you're in Beirut and things start getting violent and dangerous, for your perspective, maybe an adventure, you know, as a child, and then you go from that environment. To to you know you're, now you're in Switzerland, a real passive country, <laughs> uh, you're, you're, right? A, a completely different, a completely different environment. And from there you go to Mallorca. I mean, yeah, no, what? I mean, what a confluence of of yeah. experiences. Like, what does that do for you? How does that shape your worldview? I I don't look at it like that. I just you know at the time you don't right. you know you're you're a kid and you're just. You know, um, yeah, you're just looking to have fun, fun. As a kid. and you know, I mean, <laughs> right. that, that's all you're looking to do. You know, I wasn't think of thinking of anything like that. Uh, all time, right, let me but... rephrase the question. So, looking back on it now, mm -hmm. with you know a lifetime of experience, can you have you been able to internalize what those disparate experiences, individually and collectively? have they what they did to your worldview or did they shift your like what you have a different perspective than a lot of people do mm -hmm. what is that perspective if you have one um well i mean obviously i um having experienced like different cultures and you know um lifestyles and things like that um you know looking back at it now i mean i um and looking at what's going on right now and in, in, you know with israel and you know stuff like that it's you know it, it it was the same thing going on now that was going on in the 70s right it's the same exact thing yep and um so it's it's hard to explain i don't know i just um It's not like I'm going to say I like to have a deeper understanding because I really don't. Mm, right. I'm I'm not the one on the ground that right. that lives there like these people yeah. that live there. I mean, it's, know, I mean, it like sounds that, like in a but... in a way, and if and if I'm saying it wrong, correct me. But in a way, you were almost like um, thrown in there. We were just tossed yeah, in there, almost yeah. kind of like a like a like a perpetual tourist, right? Kind of yeah. like oh, we'll hang out here for a while. All right. Eh. We'll go to this other yeah. place. We'll hang out. So in, in a way, it's a shame, you know. I mean, because you know, you don't. Um, I mean, I totally respect those places now sure. and love the culture and loved the people. It was incredible. I never had a, a bad experience with with the, the people there, and mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. anything like that. It was just a, in a grand adventure as a kid. Yeah. It was wonderful. All right, so, so speaking of grand adventures, so let's shift forward just a little bit. And you traveled into some, once you kind of made your way back, how old were you by the time you made your way back to the States? Just kind of, you know, I'm back. Well, I graduated high school in Washington, D.C., so. All right, so you were. 16, 17. 18, all right, so you wound up traveling into some interesting circles, especially in the 80s and 90s. Talk to me about the music scene back then. How did you get into that, and, and what was that like? Because I have, I'm a, I'm a big, as you can tell behind me, I'm a very big. Yeah, big, I see I'm it. A, I'm a huge music guy. It's a huge yeah. part of my life. It always has been. I'm a musician myself. I uh, see the guitar. Yeah, yeah. I'm a, drum, well I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a drum. I'm a drum. I'm a drummer. I play a little guitar. I had a lot of my uncle actually. He used to work for Billy Joel back in the '70s and oh. early '80s a little bit. So I just kind of had a lot of a lot of touches in music. So talk mm -hmm. to me about what you were doing in the music scene. How did that happen? And just set the scene for me. Music has always been a huge part of my life. I mean, 
it started in Mexico when I, you know, I started collecting 45s and in Beirut. I mean, my first album was, um, I think, Jethro Tull Aqualung or something. <laughs> Maybe Grand awesome. Funk Railroad or Velvet Underground. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It would have been my mom that bought me the Velvet Underground album. So wow. I was okay. in the music. Um, and then in Washington, D.C., I started really getting into um you know, piano and stuff. like. And I went to a, a place called, at that time it was called Western School of the Arts. Now it's called Duke Ellington School of the Arts and in Washington, D.C. And it's like a theater and music. It's a high school, sort of like, you remember that series, that silly series called Fame? Yep. Well, that's pretty much what that was. Right. And I got in for piano because you have to audition. And um, so I got in for piano and coronet. So music has always been a part of my life, but and I always like fancied myself as you know, in the future, like being in a band or being sure. something. Like of that. course, <laughs> I had it, it, um, terrible anxiety, so I could never be in front of people. Oh, okay. So I couldn't like play in front of people or anything like that. But uh, I had all my friends were musicians, and I would write, and I could write music, and so we were involved in that, and then. Um, when I went to college, uh, um, I went to a small Presbyterian college in North Carolina called Montreat. And um, after that, I went to Cal State University in, in Long Beach in California. And it was there that I really ended up falling into the scene, you know, the alternative punk rock scene. Right. After I got out of college there, because I met, you know, I guess I don't want to say the wrong girl because she wasn't really the wrong girl. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she got me into the scene and, you know, I always, my degree was in film. And so I always thought I'd be a filmmaker, but ended up falling into the music scene and ended up borrowing money from my mom and opened a record store in Seal Beach, California. That Did was, you really? Yeah. Wow. Primarily punk and alternative. And, oh, get out. Um, so you, so you were, uh, so, so what was it? You were, you were high fidelity before high fidelity. You were yeah, exactly. You, you were yeah. John Cusack. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'm no, 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 just kidding. But, you know but, I mean. but coincidentally, I mean, I ended up doing a film called Roadside Prophets that John Cusack was in. Oh, God. But, um, <laughs> but, you know, so I met him like briefly. But um, so, so hold but, on. So, yeah, that changed yeah. everything. So so talk, talk to me about that. I mean, you know, the violent femmes, social distortion, ball and chain from social distortion is still one of my favorite songs. I yeah. love that song. Nick Cave, John Cale, Chris Isaac, the chili peppers. Talk to like No, you disagree. <laughs> yeah, that's right. No yeah. worry. I do my, I do my homework to talk to yeah. me about this. Like what was going on? What was what, what was happening? Talk to me about this. Well, the the record store was in a very conservative town in Seal Beach, California, which was a beach community. It was on Main Street. Um, I used to, I started with doing in-store signings with a lot of bands. And, you know, I remember Sisters of Mercy, Nina Hagen, you know, like, um, I mean, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys came in, stuff like that. And there'd be a line of kids because we were like between what we called the Orange Curtain, which was Orange County and Los Angeles. And a lot of the kids there, they didn't have cars. They had nowhere to go for music because they couldn't go all the way to D.C. or like deep in Orange County, at like, uh, you know, the Cuckoo's Nest or whatever. Um, so they would come to my store and eventually we were closed down. You know, we were forced to close. And But I had found a location called Why? Fender's Ballroom. Uh, Why well, were you forced to close? Just, we got had a lot of – because – <laughs> you starting some just shit. envisioned like a couple hundred <laughs> kids lined up in main street with mohawks and stuff like that oh that must have been amazing. no violence nothing like that but i, it I get it became very difficult for us you know i opened it with gail who was my girlfriend at the time um and i remember meeting um someone who was like huge in the concert promoting and so I really got into that. And but did you I, have a mohawk, though? That's the question. No, no. I, was, <laughs> okay. I loved the music, but I, I dressed like I do now, you know. And right. But I found a, a place called Fender's Ballroom. It held 1,500 people. I mean, a low freaking ceiling. Right. And, uh, and a stage where if you were in a punk band like Social Distortion, you know, Mike Ness used to like to jump. Mm -hmm. You hit your head on the ceiling. But I remember, you know, this is a cool venue. And um, 
I remember being, I had met through the record store a guy named um, Dave Rat, and he was into developing his own sound systems. And so he developed a sound system that he put into Fenders. And now Dave Rat is, he's huge. He like tours, he toured with Nirvana and for this, with the sound system he built for them. Wow. And, you know, I might, in like Soundgarden, I mean, everybody. Wow. And so he did some for Fenders. And the first show, I came up with enough money to, because you have to go through the agents, you know, okay. um, you know, like writers, the the musicians, they have booking agents and stuff yep. like that. So I had to deal with them and I had to give a deposit. And the first band was the Violent Femmes. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And, um, I don't remember who the opening act was, but... Right. Um, I remember it sold out more than sold out. It was crazy. It was insane. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, we had to turn people away and wow. it was like, a, it was in a sweat box. And it, then from there, it just grew. And so, when so you had the chili peppers play there too? Red hot chili peppers. Um, so were they, so at that time, were they kind of as, you know, they were, no, well, they were uh, no doubt oh. had, no doubt had no their doubt. show at Fender's ballroom. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh, I you know, I Johnny Thunders, uh Sisters of Mercy, um, uh -huh. Social Distortion, I can't count Black Flag. Um, I uh -huh. mean, I can go on and wow. on. I mean, so many bands. And then um it became tough, like um, because there would be be bands that we'd lose money and and it'd be difficult paying and yeah. you know, and and I, I started thinking I need to get into some, you know. A club environment where it's like taken care of and so i remember finding this meat market called it was called bogarts and literally meat market was a term back then where like yep. you know it'd be like you know dis, disco nightclub whatever yep. and um and it held 450 500 people and the owner was really cool i said listen i talked to him to say just give, give me sunday nights you know and he gave me Sunday night. And I, I think the first band we had not think it was a band called sort of a local LA, pretty good band called Wednesday Week. And it was packed. And that Sunday did better than their Thursday, Fridays, you know, or Saturdays. Huh. And so we said, well, I'll give you a couple of nights. And so started getting more bands. And eventually they said, listen, you come here full time, we'll pay you, give you an office and you can just do this for, you know, I said, yeah, hell yeah. Hell, hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can, you can, I mean, I can. <laughs> oh, but, you know, I had met at vendors like John Kale and, you know, people like that. And so I already had established like with the agents and with the right. bands, you know, a, a, a name for, you know, for booking. And so it was easy to get the contacts for, and we actually, had an advertising budget, which is something I didn't have at Fenders. Right. Fenders was gorilla, you know, like gorilla filmmaking. You're yeah. I'm lucky reservoir dogs, like your poster yeah, right there. Absolutely. A lot of those early films were like gorilla filmmaking. Right. And um, it was the same with concerts. Yep. For some promoters. It, you, mm -hmm. All you had were the flyers. And That's right. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, I remember. Oh, yeah. 5,000 flyers. And that was it. But at Bogarts, I had a budget. So we had the LA Times. Right. Orange County Register, the you know all that kind of stuff, and and it, it became phenomenal. I mean, like the Los Angeles Times reviewers, they go there and review bands, and right. so you know, so got a huge. Name. I, we still, I just have so much more to get to. I, we could talk about this forever. And the next time we hang, I can out, go I'm, on forever about. I know the next time I see so you, we're going to. I, I have more questions. I got to get to. So you also had some interactions with the counterculture figures: Hunter S. Thompson, Timothy Leary, John Waters. Like, how does this happen? Who, it was actually a, I have to ask, who the fuck are you? Like, no, it's <laughs> not me. This it, 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 seriously, it's not me. It's like everything that uh, I fell into was a natural segue. It was just uh, very natural. And in Bogart, at Bogarts, there was a Wednesday night that was dead. And we couldn't, it doesn't matter who we booked, it just wouldn't do well. And I had met a guy named, uh, who's still my friend, a very close friend of mine, Bill Stanky, um, who uh, booked the college tours for, you know, everyone from Timothy Leary to G. Gordon Liddy to, you know, Hunter Thompson, you know, everybody. And I thought, 
you know, it'd be really cool to, you know, do like a evening, a conversation, you know, on a Wednesday night format. Yeah. Um, I don't remember who was first, but um, I, maybe John Waters, the filmmaker, John Waters. Yeah. He, he did stand up comedy um, at Bogart's. It was the first nightclub he ever did. And um, and then people like Jim Carroll. You remember that song? All the people that die, die. Yeah. Very, very famous. You know, like late seventies. So, so I have to ask you, just because we're we're a little short on time. What was it like? So, what was Hunter S. Thompson? What, you met him. What 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 was he like? You know, to to be in a room with this guy. I mean, I've said it before. I mean, like on other other things, like Hunter. I've I've done several shows. Yeah. And again, Bogus was the first nightclub setting that he's ever done. And it sold out, sold out two shows. And Grace Slick and Paul Cantor from Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship introduced yep. him. And it was huge. And I said, I'm picking him up at the airport, which right. is the biggest mistake you can make in your life. <laughs> oh, I mean, God. the first thing that Bill Stanky said when I, I said, can I get Hunter S. Thompson in, at the nightclub? He goes, I mean, quote, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> I said, Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. What's up? All right, I gotta hear now, now I have to hear that. Yeah, no. But I, I pick him up at the airport. He's unmistakable. I mean, he, he actually at that time he could smoke cigarettes on a plane. He came out with a his cigarette on one of those yeah, know, those long with the, with the big filter, you know, right? Typical Hunter Thompson with his sunglasses. It was like the epitome. Of, I mean, it was just Hunter S. Thompson. And um the first thing he said is, Where the bar? Where the bar? And I, I go, what? excuse me, what? It's like a for the fortunate thing with me is I grew up in different countries in the world, so I could you know, pick up on accents and you know things right. that people I couldn't understand because I could not understand Hunter for for a while, and then all of a sudden I started understanding. So him. You learned how to speak Thompson. Uh, speak Thompson, you know, yeah. it's because he's drunk and right. you know all the time, and um, he's like, "Where's the bar?" Oh, the bar. Okay. <laughs> and I go, well, we really need to get back for the show, you know, because it's in like two hours and we, we have to, you know, get get you get you to the club. And he goes, no, I got to go to a bar. Got to go to a bar. Got to see the sports and basketball. So, you know, there's a big basketball game on. So um, I got him into the car. I rented a red convertible, you know, after the shark, and, you know, fear and loathing in Las Vegas. Yep. And um, we're driving. And we pass Rodon to a beach. He goes, I know this beach. I know this beach. It's a good sports bar here. And he convinced me to go to the sports bar. Four hours later, no, two no. hours late on the show. I'm getting, you know, at that, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't right. have anything like that. Oh, but no. um, I ended up getting to a pay phone and calling, you know, right. my the the club, uh, my stage manager and stuff. Listen, you know, I, I'm trying to get him there. It's just really difficult. And they're going, people are going crazy. You know, they're going nuts. And so finally, he he gets to the show, and it was like phenomenal. It was like all, all right. So I got to ask. So how does this punk rocking quasi hippie music guy get into law enforcement? Like, how does that happen? This is not an intuitive pathway. Um, as a kid, I always like envisioned myself as a you know you know always wanted to be a cop. You know, I mean, it's it just like. A, a romantic notion it was like something i always thought i wanted to do and i was reading detective comics and all that kind of stuff and you know also my dad had a lot to do with that because i never really knew what he did but i i knew it had something to do with not local you know but you know worldwide stuff and so it was sort of ingrained in me and um i ended up like the turning point was I ended up like uh, getting the rights to Tunner Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with his partner, Layla Nabulsi, who... Um, you actually you actually had the rights to the book? Yeah, and we were lucky to get it. It was after Roadside Profits, my film, and we were lucky to get it made. And I, I really was thinking after Roadside Profits, it was really the movie right. that I did. It, was, it wasn't really fun. And then I'm thinking, do I really want to do this? You know, like, you know, and I, I really want to be a writer, and that's all I've ever really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I loved loved the, the idea of being a, you know, writing about crime. And it was always in my head to, you know, 
And I didn't want to go federal because I didn't want to move every four years. All right. So you're Washington, so, D.C. was home base. So, so what, I, what kind of what roles within law enforcement did you did you hold? I wanted to always be a detective. And so I applied to the Metropolitan Police Department of Washington, D.C. while I had when I had the rights to fear and loathing and ended up getting accepted and um, got into the academy in like 1993 or something like that. And um, and when I was in the academy, Layla ended up getting with Johnny Depp and then fear and loathing got made, which I was really I mean, there was no jealousy. It was like incredible. Great. She got it made. But I was a freaking becoming a cop. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but at the and, time it got made, though, did, was that did you still have the rights, or did you sell them at that point? Oh no, not selling. We it, Hunter gave him gave it to us the rights. You know, there was no money involved. Uh, Layla was his uh, girlfriend. Uh, they had broken up, but he gave. So, are you were you like technically a producer on the movie? Yeah, yeah, and it was because I did roadside profits, and I met Layla, and we were going to do that, and, um, but she ended up getting it made without me and um i had no right to it at that point I right, so, uh, wow, wow god we, we should have booked four hours for this um <laughs> so no, it was a, it's just like again like i i said in the in uh, earlier it's like one segue after another and it's like it was a natural thing progression okay. in life. so you're in so you're oh, in law so you you're in law enforcement did you have an area that you sort of did you become a detective? Did you specialize in in one area? Did you just sort of hold a lot of different roles? Like, what did you actually do as law enforcement? Well, you start in uniform always, and um, again, I fell into something I was very good at, and um, uh, and ended up closing a lot of cases, and and then got into plain clothes and um, a little undercover work, and then. Became an investigator eventually, the detective. And- whoa, 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 Go back, go back. <laughs> Talk to me about undercover work. Oh, geez. <laughs> I didn't do that much of it, but Still? I, so, I, I didn't do deep cover, you know, yeah. so. Is it scary? Know. I mean, are you like, are you, you worried like you're posing as, well, not a cop and. No, uh, you don't, you know, you know, I never worried, you know, not, not because I'm some brave, incredible guy, but. I knew the the backup I had, you know, yeah. um, and also yeah. the training I had. All right, so, so yeah. we, I, I really, there's there's so much more I want to ask, but but <laughs> there's some things we we got to get to, and just real quick interlude for the folks who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for David, put them in the chat box, and we'll get to a few at the end. All right, so you were a cop, you were an investigator, you were a detective, and then you shifted into crime fiction. How did how did that happen? Like, what was the transition there? Like I said, I I wrote my. We never got into this, but I wrote my first book when I was seventeen, and I got my first rejection when I was eighteen. Wow! You know, from, from a major publisher, and uh, I, I think at this time, if that editor who rejected me had known that I was a seventeen year old kid, she probably would have been a lot, gone a lot easier on me. <laughs> it was pretty devastating, so I stopped writing for a long time. But I, I knew I always wanted to be a writer. Right. So when I was a cop, I was always writing. I was always writing stuff. And a detailed man I had been writing and working on for years and years, you know. And it wasn't until I retired that, you know, that got published by a very tiny little publisher. Um, but then so, in 2016, I ended up getting a, a pretty good deal. So how much of your real, how much of your real life criminal justice experience finds its way to the page now? as as an author well the experience a lot but stuff that happened nothing right it's all fiction you know i mean uh my muse music makes its way in there you know and right. stuff like that but uh, as far as me uh city on the edge really was more me than anything else but and also a detailed man but you know the frank mar stuff and all that you know total fiction you know none of that was real but how much do you do you find that, you know, how many years did you serve in law enforcement all in? Uh, about 17. So, I mean, you must have, I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of experience to soak up. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah. do you find that it's just, you know, when you're writing that you're just, is it just sort of like it just kind of oozes out of back out of you because you just know what the texture 
of those worlds are like and it just sort of ble bleeds onto the page or is it more oh i remember you know i worked i was in this place i worked this case and you're not writing about those cases but just the the mechanics of what you do and the environments like how does that how do you go from taking all that life experience and have it you know show up on into your fiction well, as a writer, you know, it's not all that easy. You know, I mean, uh, it's never been easy for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it never oozed out because it was like an incredibly difficult process for me. It still is. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a lot of life experience does come out on the, the page. Right. So so one question we dive into on the show often, because I... I I really love speaking to former law enforcement because, you know, as writers, you know, like, what, what do I know, you know, about what it's really like to be an FBI agent or a detective or whatever, you know, sure. I read books and, you know, you watch movies and TV shows and you think, you know, I've, I've had some experience with the police, maybe not in such great ways, but that's all. No, no. Um, how much of what we see on TV movies and you read in books and you, to your experience is accurate to the criminal justice system overall and how much is just BS to, to serve, you know, dramatic purposes. You don't really want to watch crime shows with me because I get really pissed off, but there are some shows that are incredible. I mean, like some, you know, streaming series like Mindhunter on Netflix. Yes. yes. We, 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 I've spent a lot of time. I actually, I know Mark Olshaker quite well. Mark is a, is a good, good dude. He's yeah, I've had him, too. I've had and, him on the uh, show several times. Yeah, and John, you know, I mean, John but, Douglas. Um, yeah, John Douglas, and you know, so there's shows like that, and you know, honestly, like shows like SVU and you know, Law and Order. There, they have good consultants. They have great right. consultants. They have real police consultants. Those are the shows that really make a difference. Is when they have like police consultants, or when it's like a writer, you know, um, that you know, uh, live live the life. You know, but then you think of The Wire, you know, th those right. weren't cops. I mean, there's David Simon and George Bellicanos later and right. stuff like that. But again, they had, when it came down to making the films, the the, sh the shows, they had incredible consultants, but right. they were great writers, David Simon and George yeah. Bellicanos. And, you know, um, I mean, The Wire, oh my gosh, that was so, cops love that shit. Yeah, um, I've, I've seen it's the series very real. Yeah. multiple times, multiple times. Yeah, it's, it's very, times. very real and, and uh, yeah. to the life of, you know. Right. You know it, felt, it felt very sure. lived in. Yeah, a lot of shows, but a lot of terrible ones. And I, I'm, I'm one of the guys, like right now, I mean, we're like streaming like monk you know it's very unrealistic you know oh, again yeah. i've seen i used to watch it years and years ago but right. for some reason watching it again so let me ask you, but is it easier to fix so you watch a show like monk for example and you know it's going in it's oh, crap it, <laughs> it's silliness and you know that do you just kind of go eh, whatever yeah. and does, yeah. whereas a show that's trying to be more you got it you and it's just it right like yeah. and that, no we just don't do it like we don't do yeah. that it's the ones that are trying where you get pissed. Right. You know, Monk in the beginning, that it's right. just going to be a fun, right. silly, a, but right. great show. It's going to sure. be the guy with a, a major IQ that's OCD, <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know, things right. that they're just not going to do. You know, I mean, it's the shows that are real serious where, you know, you, you, you even take the little things, you know, finger on the trigger, dude. You know, I mean, you don't have your finger on the trigger. And, you know, um, just the little things, you know. So just, I've, I've had a few guys on who tell me, you know, when you collect evidence, it's never in a plastic bag because, right? Well, certain it, evidence you can put in a plastic bag, but. A lot of well, it, they said it was in, in paper bags. Is that accurate? Well, blood evidence and right. stuff, you know, like like that. I mean, there are certain things, documents and stuff like that you can put in a plastic bag. Sure. But, okay, fair enough. Know, when I was a detective, you could. Right. But um, certain things you get, not a plastic bag, but like uh, it's an it's a hard plastic evidence right. document. So what's, of, so of all your pet peeves, the things that just drive you bananas that they get wrong, what's the thing, this, what's one thing that just really just burns you? You're just like, no, that is not right. If, uh, finger off the trigger when you're running after a, a suspect or you're chasing after somebody. And when you shoot somebody, you're not uh, back on the job the next day. Right. 
Right, you go through an invest, right? You're and it is an investigation, right? They come on administrative happen. leave with pay right. pending pending the outcome of the investigation. How long does that normally take? I mean, what's what's average? Right. It depends and, on you know the, right. the investigation. It could take you know a month. It could take several months. Wow, wow, okay, wow. So that well, that was great. But now it's a time for a special segment on the show where we spin the wheel. On the wheel are seven possible categories, including a <laughs> few new ones I brought out for tonight. Wherever it lands is what you get, and the categories are. Known unknowns, the Wizard of Oz, soundtrack of your life, friend or foe, true crime kink, say that three times fast, apocalypse, and liquid Kool-Aid acid test. All right. Oh my gosh, you didn't tell me. What? <laughs> yeah, well, I, that's that's the show, man. It's a roller coaster. We go ups and downs. What we got for tonight, and what do you got? And you got tonight. You got no. All right, known unknowns. All right, so tell me something about being in law enforcement that you think the general public is not aware of. Um, your your what you experience the dead bodies and um, you know the images that you see how they stay with you. Yeah, I was actually I, I've spoke I've asked this a few times to some other folks and they said and I said you know well when you see these terrible things and or experience them like how do you get over it? He said you don't. Mm -hmm. Is, is that is that accurate to your experience? Yeah. 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 It's not like, you know, every cop has PTSD. I don't have PTSD, but I mean, right. it's just like, you know, there's things that stay with you, mm -hmm. you know, that should stay with you. you Certain things you can never unsee or ever unknow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So what we're going to do is now, now we're going to pick your poison. I got three choices for you and I'm not going to, I got A, B, and C, and I'm not going to tell you what's behind each one. So you just pick A, B, or C. <laughs> I like C. <laughs> C. All right. All right. Well, now you're back. Now we're, I'm going to put you in the writer's room. This is for anyone who is writing crime fiction that they want to get across that feels, you know, at least mostly, you know, realistic. From more from your point of view, what elements do you think are critical that they get right? And what pitfalls do you avoid that do you recommend that they avoid? Um. Wait, say that. So again? if you if if you're gonna if you were if you were in a writer's room and you were saying, all right, guys, we're gonna we're doing a cop show, or you're gonna or you're advising on authors who want to write crime fiction, and they want to and they want the fiction to feel you know somewhat you know realistic. From your point of view, what elements do you think that they app they're critical that you have to get right, and what pitfalls do you recommend that they avoid? Beyond well, beyond what you've already said. Yeah. The um. What they have to get right is the, the treatment of, of evidence and the crime scene and stuff like that, and, um, and the life, you know. Well, hold on. What, what what do you mean with the evidence? Like, what do you mean specifically? Well, how how you recover evidence and things like that. Like, for example, uh, I don't. Yeah, yeah. How you treat a dead body, for instance, and you know. You don't like move a dead body to, you know, uh, things like that. Can I tell you? I act. I actually did that, and I was scolded by the police. Oh, really? I did. Yeah, you don't do that. Yeah. Well, there. It was. Well, if there's ever a time that we're alone, I'll tell you the story. You'll understand why I did it. <laughs> why? Oh, yeah. We'll get into that then yeah. <laughs> later. <laughs> so, all right. So. You don't you don't move a dead body. What about evidence? What were you talking like? What specifically about the handling? Like, what's the what do they need? What do we need to get right? If we're going to write about handling evidence, what do we have to get right? How you recover evidence, how you pick things up. And um, I think someone made a comment about like uh, what goes in bags and stuff like that and what you recover, like clothing, you know, have, you know, clothing always goes in a paper bag, stuff like that. You know, um, just how you treat a crime scene. You know, a lot of times, you know, like they allow everybody and their mother on a crime scene. You don't you don't do that. Right. Right. You know, the detective is actually in charge over, you know, uh, officials and, and officials can say, no, I'm coming in. They can. But then you notebook their name and, you know, their badge number and everything else. Right. You know, that's something you don't do. Um, and it rarely happens where an official. And also, you know, little things like where uh, the FBI says we're taking over this investigation—that that, that uh, you know—that rarely happens. Right. Know? 
right, right. Okay, fair enough. All right, so now we're going to give you some truth serum. I got 10 questions for you. You ready? Mm -hmm. All right, favorite flavor? Questions. Don't worry, don't, it's, this is going to be quick. <laughs> favorite flavor ice cream? Um. Oh my God, I do have a favorite. Uh, uh, and it totally, I totally gelled. I mean, I, I um, uh, butter pecan. Okay, there you go. I'm, I'm with you. Okay, what's one food you will never eat ever for any reason? Liver. I'm with you there as well. Bucket <laughs> list. So you've had some experience, but bucket list destination anywhere in the world? I don't really have a bucket list destination. You don't. There's no place on earth you want to go. Um, maybe Alaska. Okay, there you go. Scariest movie you ever saw? Oh, The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Um, I guess, you know, the fly. <laughs> okay. Well, so normally I ask, because but you've already answered, do you play any musical instruments? You said piano and clarinet. But if you could no, play... No, no, coronet. Coronet, coronet. sorry. Are there, if you could play any other instrument, what would it be? Guitar. Okay. Cats or dogs? Uh, this is dangerous. Definitely dogs. Okay. Favorite cocktail? I, I love I love cat dogs. Okay. There you go. Favorite cocktail? Um, um uh, Dry martini. Dirty right. martini. All right. All right. So here's one you're going to, you might appreciate this. You ready? You can see a live performance, sports, music, theater, whatever, any seat, any venue, any time in history, what's your choice? It would have been a To Kill a Mockingbird when it first came out with, um, and I'm, his name is- Gregory Peck? No, 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 the, the theater. Oh, I saw and, it. By the way, yeah. I saw it, I saw it yeah. with Ed. Although, although I missed it though, I got I got Ed Harris. That's what I got. I didn't get um, uh, Jeff I, I wanted him, I wanted the original, and his name is- escaping. Jeff Daniels. Jeff Daniels, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just I just missed just I just missed him by like a week. All right. If you could get a continuation of any canceled TV show ever, what would it be? The wire. Okay, fair enough. All right. So do we, I'm gonna check to see if we have any questions in the chat box. All right, okay. I got one for you. How do you avoid getting into any form of legal addiction, smoking, vaping food because of the stress of the role? keeping yourself physically and mentally in a good place. I guess this is when you're in law enforcement. You mean me getting addicted? To I guess, I, you know, just in general, I guess if you're, if you're just talking from, even from your experience. Oh, you're, like alcohol or. Yeah. yeah. Um, or <laughs> that's, I actually did. And I'm going to confess, I, I ended up, you know, like um, smoking again. I quit. I haven't smoked for a while, but it's easy to get caught up in things like like that you know that can help with uh stress and you know alcohol is you know a big thing you know um but how do you avoid it that's the question how do you avoid getting into any form of legal addiction smoking vaping food because of the stress I, you know, quite honestly, if I had, if I knew the answer to that, I <laughs> if I knew, I would have. Right <laughs> so I, I guess mean, the answer is you don't. <laughs> yeah, you, you, yeah, you just, you just uh, don't do the first time. <laughs> you know, don't take that first cigarette. You okay. know, I don't, you know, I don't know. All right, all right, fair enough. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen. We got, I got some stuff to, some goodies to share, and then we're gonna wrap it up. All right, so bear with me just a minute here. All right. Uh, okay. All right. So, David. So, t tell tell us what we're looking at. What is this? It's a sweet thing. My my novel that came out um, a few months ago. Okay. And so, what what's the setup of the novel? Like, what what's the what's the basic plot here? It's a a, a DC homicide detective who gets caught up in a an in investigation uh, that. Um, where is an old informant of his might be involved and then he um it's 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 real i'm terrible at, at you know talking about my own books but it's it's about getting caught up in a relationship that is you know that is is bad and you know what what happens when, when what happens 
So you know, in the academy, they, you know, they teach us three things, you know, that you never do, um, that can destroy you as a detective or as an officer, as, you know, sex, you know, drugs and, you know, you know, certain relationships. And, you know, he, he gets caught up in that. Okay. Well, okay. Destroy your career. Okay. So, and, and this came out when? Um, it was released in November. All right. So great. So this is a, this is a new one. All right. Great. So, all right. Everyone sounds, if you, if you want to get the down and dirty about uh, what uh, breaking some of those prime rules can do to you, check this out. All right. Very good. All right. As for me, uh, I'll call my attention since we're keeping up with crime. Uh, so this is my noir novella collection, Murder in Montague Falls. It's myself and Sonny Hatton and Patrick Thomas. There are three noir novellas. The protagonists, they're all teenagers, but this is not young adult. This is adult. This is adult fiction. All the teenagers, uh, the, the three teenagers went to the same high school, but in three uh, in this fictional town of Montague Falls, but in three different decades. So mine starts off um, in the 1980s uh, during the Reagan era Red Scare, where um, and this is loosely and I say loosely based on something that did actually happen to me. Um, a teenage paper boy is out collecting on his route one night and, uh, this old woman who's, who's a customer isn't answering. So he kind of looks through the window. He thinks, but isn't sure that he sees her get murdered. He freaks out, doesn't know what to do. He hems and haws and ultimately decides to investigate the crime himself. And things get rather dicey for him. In the second story, which takes place in the 1990s, um, this teenage uh, girl, Natalie, is into the dark arts and pentagrams and whatnot, and it's sort of loosely based on the West Memphis Three uh, and these two best friends. They're not the sharpest tools in the shed. They're both vying for her attention, and she draws them in deeper and deeper and deeper into her dark and twisted world, and boy, did things get gruesome. And then in the third story, it takes place actually in the 1950s, classic noir Sultry high school's teacher seduces one of her students in the hopes that he will murder her husband, and that's what we got. So you get you get three for the price of one. If you're in, if you're into crime, if you're into crime and cops and things that kind of go sideways, I highly recommend that you check out Murder in Montague Falls, which is um, available on Amazon and published by Crazy Eight Press. Okay, folks. That's our show. I want to thank my guest tonight, David Swinson, for coming out and talking to us about rock his life and rock and roll and, and punk rock and Hunter S. Thompson <laughs> and all sorts of other crazy stuff. And I want to thank everyone who's watching at home. Um, I'm your host, Russ Colt Shamiro. And as always, be gentle, be kind, be generous of spirit. And for God's sakes, go read a book. And I'll, I'll see you guys all next week. All right. Thanks, guys. And be good. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye, bye now, guys. And I'll see you next time. Sounds good. OK.